See what I'm doing here, Brooksy? I'm pouring one out. I know out. what it looks like you're doing. I'm pouring one out for Red Sox fans by losing their shortstop, one of their faces of the franchise, Xander Bogarts, headed back to, not back, headed to the good side over here on the West Coast. San Diego Padres, 11 years, $280 million. Don't you applaud this. And the Red Sox basically were Patrick Starr and SpongeBob and was like, I have $2. I have three dollars. That's Listen, what that, that was. That, that's live footage. Listen, of the Red Sox. um, here's my stance on it, and uh, we had a really good guest for you guys, a, a beat writer for the Red Sox, Pete Abraham, who's gonna break this all down and tell you the truth. And I'll I, let me be emotional. <laughs> Look, the uh, the Boston Red Sox could not match the San Diego Padres' offer. Eleven years. He's 30. He's going to be 41 years old. That's absurd. But to you have to overpay for elite talent to, to secure the prime of superstars. And AJ Preller is not afraid to do that. Um, <clears throat> listen, it sucks. But, you know, the Red Sox came in at, I don't know, six years, 160, something, something along those lines. I'll confirm that with Pete when we get him on here. But. They should have gotten a deal done in spring training. If they probably did a six-year 180-30 per, he would have signed it in spring training, in my opinion. I don't know that. I did not ask him that. That is purely my opinion. That's the shameful part. Like, I work for the team. People are going to say, you're apologetic for the team. You're just, you know, standing up for them. No. They, they couldn't have – they can't match what San Diego did. That would have been – irresponsible for the organization to match 11 years and $280 million. The shameful part is not getting a deal done throughout the year when you knew the number and you just wouldn't go to it. Even six year 160 right now is not enough. That, that only involved, I think only one year of him making $30 million. We're talking a top three shortstop in the game. In my opinion. I mean, the, 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 the stats back it up. You think it's irresponsible for the Padres to have offered and he has now accepted an 11 year deal. Because if you're going to say it's irresponsible for the Red Sox to have offered that same yes. length, you believe yes. it's also irresponsible for the Padres. irresponsible. So do you think it's a bad move? For this you're, you're, you're teeing me up so you can clip this and I can get yelled out on Twitter. I'm not an idiot. This is what you do. You you get me riled up and you put it right in front of my face and I say it and you clip it so I look like a dumbass. Irresponsible. Have I ever made you look? I doubled, I'm doubling down. I'm doubling down. Irresponsible. When I, Yes, he can DH. He can play third, whatever. He's going to be 41 years old, dude. I didn't think he would. I thought eight years would be the max mm. to get him a thirty-eight. That's that's late, especially for someone as a shortstop, a big body guy. He takes care of his body. I know that. I've seen it firsthand. He he will be fine into his late thirties. But once you start getting 38, 39, 40, who knows, man? You're forty. You're a man. <laughs> You're forty. All right. Irresponsible. You know what I think is happening. But that's hold on. Like Go but ahead. irresponsible, but fucking balls. Yeah. Fucking balls. Because you know what? They're like, you know what? We see the Dodgers aren't really doing shit right now. Yeah. We're going to get a leg up, and we're going to beat them, and we're going to be a World Series team because they were pretty good last year. And now they're going to have Tatis back. He's going to be an outfielder, a corner outfielder. You're going to have Xander Bogarts. Like, this is this is a really good ball club. Xander Bogarts is going to walk in that clubhouse day one and be a leader because that's who he is, and he's going to make that team better. Because any room he walks in, you leave after talking to him, and you feel better about yourself. You feel like you learned something. He, This is a massive loss for the Boston Red Sox. You know what I kind of think is happening with some of these younger GMs is – they're millennials. And a lot of people think they're not millennials. No, no, no. Like millennial, that generation goes all the way back until like 1990 or something like that. The, the birth, it's, it's something like 1988, maybe even. Millennials act on impulse, typically, generally speaking. Yeah. So guys like AJ Preller, uh, Jerry DePoto up in Seattle, 
younger front office executives. They see a window, they attack it. Impulsive. Call it irresponsible. You could certainly make that argument. You you absolutely could make that argument. But I'm right just, now, I'm just jealous. Let's be honest. <laughs> but but you're not wrong either. No, you're, no, I I stand by what I say. Xander Bogarts is going to be a 250 <clears throat> hitter hitting 15 home runs when he's 40 years old, and he's going to be making 30 plus million dollars a year. And we're going to say, yikes, what a tough contract that is for San Diego. However. How is many? he though? Because I feel like the years, I feel like the years of that contract were part of the big reason of, uh, uh, to make it less AAV so they could build around them. But I don't know. I don't, I don't know how they built that contract. I think the details are still pouring out there. But point is, is that odds are he best case scenario is he's a league average player at 40 years old. And he's probably not playing shortstop anymore. I'm just being realistic here. No, no, that's realistic. So, so 280 divided by 11 is basically 25 and a half okay that's not so bad at all actually yeah so that's why they that's why they probably went to an 11 year deal so like we can give you 25 a year you're still gonna get your you're still gonna get broke off like you're still gonna get paid but we can you know we have an extra five million dollars a year to build around mm-hmm. and, into somebody else by the way a lot of people are probably thinking well Heim Bloom's a young guy why isn't he acting in an <clears throat> look at his background political guy so you have your and don't get me wrong all these front office guys now they understand analytics. AJ Preller understands analytics. Uh, Jerry Depoto does too. I'm not saying that, but they have different priorities. A guy like Hein Bloom, um, obviously Billy Bean over in Oakland, analytically driven over in Tampa Bay still to this day. Listen, these guys, every one of these GMs, they walk in a room, they're the smartest guy in the room. Like they, they know what they're doing. So when they, they just, they on- all just have different plans and different trajectories of what they want the organization to look like. So when guys like Hein Bloom, act on impulse they don't act on impulse with finances they act on impulse with analytics like they right. s- find a guy that has an on base percentage over 400 in double a and they go i want him and right. they act on impulse that but they're not acting on impulse by spending a bunch of dough right and i aj Prello is going to get all the credit for san diego and he deserves a lot of it because this team was the laughing stock of the league Yes, but a lot of people forget about ownership. Like those, that's who writes that's the checks. Point. Exactly. That's who makes funds available, and that's who says, "Go spend whatever you want, AJ Preller. Make this happen because I want a World Series ring." Peter Seidler, he is the owner of the San Diego Padres. He owns the largest. He's the largest stakeholder of the San Diego Padres. He deserves. 90% of this credit. AJ Preller gets the other 10%. These are the guys that people most people don't even know their names. They just know the GMs. And that people are like, Heim Bloom, we want Heim Bloom's head on a stake. Well, like, dude, he did what he could do with the money that was made available to him. Let's not forget that. 2010. That's not that long ago, right? Like <clears throat> 12 years ago. But 2020, what well, 2010, that's this generation for sure. That's yeah. not all that long ago. San Diego Padres opening day payroll in 2010, $37.8 million. That was the second lowest. Let me guess this year. And by the way, that was long before Peter Seidler took over as the owner. This year's got to be like 220 something. 235. Oh. He projected 2023 Padres opening day payrolls, $235 million. That is the third highest in Major League Baseball. They went from second lowest to third highest in 12 years. Wow. Adding on to that, this was July 25th, 2018. So even more recent, four years ago. This was the first year Eric Hosmer uh, signed his deal in the first year of his deal. But it was before they got Machado. So they're still the laughing stock of the league at this point. The Padres introduced a new ticket plan that encouraged fans to root for losses. They were offering fans tickets to every home game for the rest of the season until the Padres and those fans got to see the team win five times. So it was a ticket where it was, you could get into every single game until you, the fan, witnessed five wins. And by the way, this was July, 2018. So they're That's conceding. Awful, the dude. They're conceding the season, July 2018. Fast forward here to 2022. That is just, dude. That is just an exa- prime example of this is a business. They're trying to make a profit. But credit to them, they're saying we're not going to be competitive. 
let's put our fans in. <clears throat> by the way, that package, you can buy that ticket for $99 back in, this was 2018. Fast forward four years here to 2022, the Padres are expecting to put a cap on season ticket sales for the first time because they are selling out in season tickets. This is one of the representatives for the San Diego Padres that he was quoted saying, really the one ticket area left for season ticket membership is going to be upper level at Petco Park. There's really nothing left on field level, nothing left on terrace level, nothing left in outfield reserves, unquote. So they went from begging fans to show up to Petco Park to now they are putting a cap on season tickets in four years. It's a good problem to have. What? What? Let me ask you, you played for San Diego. What was San Diego then versus now? Um, there was a little excitement, you know, the first couple months of the season because that was when Matt Kemp and Justin Upton, Derek Norris, I came over from Boston, uh, James Shields. <clears throat> we had who some names. Your, uh, that was the, that was the first time they had like some names. The shortstop. Who was your shortstop that year? Clint from Barmas. Chicago. Wasn't it from Chicago? Alexi Clint Ramirez. Barmas and Alexi Amarisa. Alexi. Oh, what about Alexi Ramirez? He was after me, I think. Oh, okay. I think it was the next year. Okay. But um, we were we were pretty good the first couple of months, and then got swept by the Dodgers. They they then they fired our manager, Buddy Black, who was like my favorite manager I ever played for. Really? After that, they just started trading everybody and got rid of everybody. They're like, oh, we're not going to be good. So never mind. <laughs> it went back to the shitter. Who was your interim manager? Was it Kase? Uh, Pat Murphy. Oh. Who's the bench coach for the Brewers. Yeah. But he was the AAA manager for the Padres for a while in El Paso. You were, you, you were in San Diego for one or two years? One. 2015. So you never had, I think it was Andy Green that was the manager. No, he was after me. Yeah. All right. A lot mm-hmm. can change, and it, it's just a choice, man. These owners that claim they're a small market team, and don't get me wrong, there's exceptions to every rule. Yeah, there is. But these owners that say they can't spend money on players, it's – You either – it depends on how much money you want to pocket after each season. San Diego is not even a top 10 market in the United States of America, <laughs> and they are now a top three payroll in Major League Baseball. Yeah. It's just a choice. That's all it is. It's a choice. It's a everybody. cycle is what it is. Yeah. You see it throughout the game, but yeah. Props to San Diego. Feel bad for Red Sox fans. Um, let's just get to Pete, man. Let's, let's get to Pete. I Bring won't join in. you in mourning, but um, I'm sure Pete will. Let's get to him. Pete Abraham. More than a decade at the Boston Globe. A couple decades now, Pete, covering Major League Baseball, if not longer. Uh, friend of the show, you've been on the Wake and Rake podcast before. Thank you for joining us and joining this time of mourning uh, for Boston Red Sox fans everywhere now that Xander Bogarts is headed to San Diego. What's the vibe down there in San Diego now? Although probably it's probably pretty positive considering where you're at. Yeah, I feel like we should all be wearing black T-shirts or something for, for this moment. But yeah, it's um, it's weird, right? I, I think I was I was texting with Xander yesterday, congratulating him on his deal, and I said, you know, I, I've probably seen you play more than anybody else. I've I've saw him play from his rookie year right up until last year. You know, all the road games, all the home games, all the spring training games. Um, you know, he's somebody I've known a long time, and he's a really good guy. Forget about the baseball part of it; he's just an excellent guy. So it's going to be weird being around the Red Sox. Um, you know, without him. I mean, it's only been a couple of years that I covered the team that Xander wasn't part of it. So uh, I can't imagine what it's like for fans who identify with him. And, you know, you go to Fenway Park and you see a lot of Xander Bogart's t-shirts and, you know, he's, I mean, he's a guy and Will can attest to this. He's never done anything wrong in his major league career. There was never a time he had to explain a comment or, you know, why he was having words with a coach or, you know, why he got ejected for something. He, He just did everything right you know, went to the all-star game, one world series and, and had, you know, the most starts at shortstop in Red Sox history, but now no longer with the team. Yeah. He, uh, you said, I mean, you nailed it. He just does, <clears throat> he does all the little things, right. And, and, and on the field, off the field, that's just who he is. And I think that was preached by his mentor, Dustin Pedroia, you know, from an early stage, Sure. And, you know, and I, and I got to be around for that as as PD kind of molded him and shaped him into the leader he is today because PD knew PD knew what was coming, uh, and PD was always good at, at, at kind of foreshadowing which guys were going to be the guys going forward. Um, it's a sad day. My eyes look puffy. It's uh, it's definitely the Florida allergies 
and not me crying in bed all day. I did pour a nice cowboy pour uh, bourbon for this podcast. I This is not shit I want to talk about today. I'll put it that way. Now, look, I work for the team. I work for Nesson. I am an, I'm a broadcaster, an analyst, whatever you want to call me for the team. You know, and I, I, I get called an apologist online uh, because I like to try to explain these moves and, and the behind them. Pete, the Red Sox could not match that offer. The, it would not be smart to offer a 30-year-old shortstop, regardless of how much you love him, an 11-year deal. I yeah. love Xander Bogarts, but they cannot. I, I, I know you have to overpay elite talent to to secure their prime. I understand that. I am okay with them not matching that deal. I'm not okay with them not getting a deal done in spring training. Well, that yeah, that's the point I've been going back to with people is that I understand you didn't want to pay what it cost last night. You could have taken care of this in March. You could have taken care of this in May. You could have taken care of this in July. You could have taken care of this in October. They had basically two months at the end of the season where they could have done something and they didn't do it. And once he gets in the market, what his value is to San Diego is much different than what his value is to Boston. The Padres are desperate to win a World Series. They feel like they're one player away after coming pretty close last year. So that money means a lot different than what it means to the Red Sox, who have four World Series and are maybe in a little bit of a rebuilding phase. What, you know, Aaron Judge means to the Yankees, who haven't won a World Series since 2009, might be different than what he would mean to other teams. Uh, what the Phillies are trying to do and the money they're spending. They haven't won a World Series going back to 2000. I think it's 2008. You know, they their owner wants to, you know, have a legacy of being a champion. So the Red Sox, I the big mistake the Red Sox made is they did not recognize what his value would be once he got in the open market. They let him get in the open market and they lost control of it. I have a question when it comes to that. Um, he signed his extension in 2019, correct? Yeah, right before. The and season. it was a six year, six year, 120. Uh, and that that's the contract he just opted out of for people that right. don't know that. Um, why didn't he sign a mega deal then? Like, what's the difference between then and now? What? From you being around the team every day and knowing Xander and knowing the team in the front office, what's the difference? Well, I think the biggest thing was at that point, Dustin had really only been gone from the team for one year. You know, uh, he was on his way out. Uh, David was on, you know, had been gone for a while. Xander at that point was starting to become the face of the team along with Mookie, one of the, you know, the older, you know, quote unquote, older guys. Right. And he, he wasn't comfortable in that yet. He was still growing into that role. And Scott Boris says to him, hey, you know, you have this value on the open market. I think you should go on the market. You, you'll do very well for yourself. Xander wasn't convinced of that. He, he wasn't sure that teams saw him in that way because he had always been sort of the second banana to, to Dustin and David and these other great players. So they kind of made a they made a deal with amongst themselves and said, OK, well, I'll negotiate this contract for you right now. But you're going to have to have an opt out because you're going to see what your value is over time. And Boris said, I, I can't make this deal for you unless we do the opt-out. It makes no sense. And Xander agreed. The Red Sox agreed. And that's at 30 years old because that's kind of the line for most teams. Sure. And guess what? The deal was great for the Red Sox. Xander, you know, raked for three years. You know, they, they did some really good things. All-star, silver slugger, the whole bit. And then right now, you know, the, this was a, it turned out Boris was very prescient. This was a good time for him to go into the market. And guess what? He, you know, he got a huge number from San Diego. Now, they couldn't have known that three years ago, but I think Xander understood now is the time to, to go into the market because he was an older guy. He's mature. He's comfortable with his leadership. He's such an established player that what team could he not go to that the other players wouldn't respect him? Right. He's going to walk into the San Diego clubhouse and they're going to say, hey, here's a guy with two rings and you know, four all-star appearances. He's an automatic leader right. in any clubhouse. No problem. You know, even with Manny Machado there, even with the other guys they have there. Doesn't matter. He's going to be one of the guys everybody will say, hey, let's listen to what he says. He's won the World Series. So I think that's what made it easier for him to, to explore his value. Allow me to entertain this theory. Especially since the COVID 2020 season, I feel like the landscape in Major League Baseball has completely been altered. Teams like the Red Sox, the Yankees, the Dodgers have always spent money on the West Coast, but those big market teams out on the East Coast are not used to these West Coast teams forking it out. San Francisco is now willing to spend money. 
Seattle just spent a bunch of money on Julio Rodriguez and is seemingly willing to spend more money on free agents. Uh, the Angels are not afraid to spend some dough as well. Is it just me or does it seem like these East Coast teams such as the Red Sox and the Yankees are having a tougher time acclimating to these West Coast teams now finally catching up to the financial uh, standard? Well, there's more competition now that, you know, the Red Sox and Yankees used to be able to bully everybody in the American League and they can't really do that anymore. I think there's a lot of things going on. You look at the money that they're bringing in, you know, the uniform patches are going to bring in an enormous amount of money. The you know, the Red Sox used to have Nesson and the Yankees. Yes, other teams didn't have their own regional networks. Now they do. And then you look at when, whenever there's, whenever there's a new CBA, there's always a lot of spending the following year because the owners understand, okay, here are the financial parameters. Here's what we know it's going to cost. Here are the penalties. Now we'll go spend. They don't spend leading up to the CBA because they're not exactly sure what it's going to be. Well, if you're the, the owner of the Padres, you're the only pro sports team in town now that the Chargers left. You have this beautiful park that you need to fill. This guy can own his city if he wins a World Series. Uh, Seattle hasn't won ever. You know, they have they, the last time they were in the playoffs, you know, before this year was was back, you know, in the turn of the century. If they win, they're going to own, you know, they're going to be just as big as the Seahawks. So I think these owners now are understanding the value of winning and what that can mean beyond a trophy. You know, what that means to your network, what that means to, you know, fans, you know, for years, you know, you sell season tickets, you sell merchandise, all of that kind of stuff. And it's 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 a different market now than it was 10 years ago. I th- I think I, I think the San Diego and some money like I don't it's it's not like this crazy th- formula that teams have to figure out, like spend money, you get fans. It's pretty I th- simple. I think the San Diego Padres see a crack in the armor, too, that is the Los Angeles Dodgers, because. There's still a ton of questions with the Dodgers. There were there were questions with the Dodgers in the postseason with their pitching issues and injuries and this and that, uh, their bullpen, the lack of closer. So I think the Padres are like, the next few years are our go time. Like we'll eat the end of these contracts, whatever we got to do, but we got to win now. Well, Manny's got an opt out in his contract in a couple right. years. So next year, that, yeah, and right. that after next year, is it after next? Yeah, it might be. So yeah. that's part of it. <laughs> you know, some of their other guys are going to be coming up on free agent. You know, like they they've got a window. It's only going to be so big. So if Xander's the difference between, you know, this group won a World Series and this group didn't win a World Series, you know, you make you make that move. You take the, you They lead the league in shortstops. So there's yeah. that. Yeah. There's uh, four Pete, of them. Pete, you reported that the Red Sox did not finish second, third, or maybe even fourth in the Xander Bogart sweepstakes. How far away were they in the sweepstakes? And what other teams do you know were involved in those sweepstakes? The, the Cubs were definitely in there. Uh, from what I understand, the Twins were definitely in there. Obviously, the Padres were. It was described to me as as a canyon. It, it was such a big gap that towards the end, the Red so- it wasn't the kind of thing where they went back to the Red Sox and said, hey, here's what the Padres are offering. They knew the Red Sox weren't going to go there. And at one point, Boris just said, all right, we understand what you're, what you're placing as Xander's value. You know, we're, okay, we're done because he's going to get more than that. And the Red Sox were like, well, that's, you know, that's what we think. And I think to some degree, the Red Sox were hoping that Xander would say, I can't leave the Red Sox, you know, make the best deal you can. But he didn't do that. And yeah, towards the end, it was the Red Sox were not involved. They they were moving on to other things. And Boris was working with the five teams that were interested in Xander. Was it six at 160 that was the offer? Is that what I read? Yeah, and there were a lot of deferrals in that. The, the present right. day money wasn't the same. There were no deferrals in the Padres offer. It was a straight offer. And Xander at, Xander was at the Celtics Suns game in Phoenix while all of this is going on. Right. And he stepped out and called one of Boris's guys and <clears> said, "Hey, you know where are we at? And let me know what the Red Sox offer is." And they explained it to him. And Xander said, "That's you know that's it." And he goes, "That's it." And he goes, what? "He said the quote was, there's zero chance I can take that." No, there's only one year of him making thirty million dollars. Yeah, that's what he basically Wait, what it was. There's zero chance I can take that. Um, it's heavy. I, so I I, I want to change gears a little bit because I we could just grind on this for hours. But um, <laughs> Rafael Devers. Uh, this is our this is the next big. I know they're hopefully they sign a couple more names to to bolster this roster a little bit. But the 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 big thing coming up is Rafael Devers. This is a superstar. Are we going to see Devers get traded? 
Like, are, is that is that a realistic thing at this point? Like, are, are they going to throw around three hundred plus million dollars or third, a third baseman that body doesn't necessarily project well? Or I, I, I'm worried now. I was thinking, oh, they'll sign Bogey. They can get Devers for a, maybe a little bit cheaper because Bogey's here because he wants to be with Xander. Now I, I feel like he's gone, and I hate to say that because I love him. He's a superstar, but what do you got? Well, so so the Red Sox traded Lester. You know, they felt like, okay, that now is the time to do it. They traded Vasquez. They felt like, well, we're not going to bring him back, so let's just get some prospects. They did not trade Bogarts, I guess, apparently thinking they would be able to convince him to sign. Looking back on it, they have to regret that. I mean, they weren't ever close, and they, they're going to get nothing back for him. They're going to get a, a draft pick after the fifth round. Had they traded him, they, they probably could have got something pretty significant back. Now, I wonder if that will influence what happens with Devers. If come – August 1st next year, they're 500 and in fourth place. Will they say, well, let's get something for Rafi now, because if we don't, you know, what's going to happen? So, and the other part of it is, I kind of disagree a little bit on Rafi will be influenced. You know, Rafi would be more likely to stay if Xander was still there. I think players do what players have to do. And you're not going to make a decision that's going to be 10 years of your life right. based on a friendship or, you know, a working relationship that might only last two more years or whatever it might be. So, and Rafi's been pretty firm about, he thinks there's a number he thinks he's worth. He hasn't said what it is to us, but he thinks there's a, there's a number out there that he thinks this is what he, what he should get. And he wants to get to that number. If the Red Sox get to that number, he'll sign. If the Red Sox don't get to that number, I think he'll happily go in the market. And if you're Rafi, right, don't you feel like, well, they let Mookie go in the market. They let Xander go in the market. Like why, you know, why would I not? Like I, you need to explore what your value is. And, Rafi's going to be a hard one, Will, because like you said, you, you wonder what he's going to look like in five years. Is he going to be a DH or a first baseman? Right. That's a lot less value than if he can play third. Um, I don't think it's a worth a work ethic issue. I just think it's more of, you know, what, you know, he, he's going to mature. You know, what's he going to mature into? And it's, you know, he's a good guy. You know, he's sort of been the little brother of that team. You know, can he be the guy who's the center of a team and, influence younger players and right. stuff you know that's you don't really know all of that stuff yet is there um is there is this going to be like a rotating dh for guys because i don't i don't know if there's a guy that can be that if and i and i honestly don't think jd martinez is the answer to bring back i, I think he's kind of hit a point in his career where he's not the same guy you know he's not yeah. he's going to have his back issues here and there and that's going to cost him some power yeah there's no dh on the market right there's nobody right. you look at and say okay that guy's a dh they, they have talked and Cora has talked about this in the past that he felt like it hurt them last year that they didn't have a DH spot where guys could rotate into and get off their feet. And that JD was only a DH. He never played the field. He didn't play the field one inning last year. Right. So I think they think that it would be nice to have a guy who's maybe a, I don't know, 85 game DH and the other games you, you know, you let, you know, whoever it may be, take a little time. The other part of it is I, I still can't figure out why they traded for Eric Cosmer. I can't either. Because you have Tristan Casas, who's a, a tall lefty hitting first baseman. Why you needed another tall lefty hitting first baseman is beyond me. I don't think Eric's a DH. I mean, he's not. At that, least financially, it's not doing a thing to the right. Red Sox. And if if they're both in the lineup, I would prefer Haas at first base instead of Casas. But yeah. then you're doing Casas at the service by not having him, you know, get better at first base. I don't. I mean, I don't, again, against right handed pitching, like, sure. Right. I just don't understand why um, why they're both on the, you know, on the same roster. And I assume right. they're going to flip Eric somewhere else, but he's got a no trade. So I don't, it's all very, yeah. you know, that made no so, sense. To me. It still makes no sense to me. Speaking of just like the roster makeup, <clears throat> I don't know if Trevor Story can play shortstop. He was in the eighth percentile on arm strength last year. We know the elbow issues has, have been there the past few years. I, I haven't spoken to him this off season about any of that. If he's rehabbing, if he's strengthening, I'm sure he is. I mean, he he's you watch him throw it doesn't look like it feels good. Um, now part of that percentile eighth percentile of arm strength is because he's a second baseman he doesn't have to throw the ball that hard most of the time and that's going to lower it. But um, I I like him as a second baseman. I thought when he's on the field he was one of the best second basemen in the game if not the best second baseman in the game, and he can get hot as anybody at the plate. Is there room? Is it a possibility that we see the Red Sox get a shortstop, or are we pro most likely going to see Trevor Story play shortstop and then Arroyo, Kike, those guys play second base? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things with that. So he he had the entire year he played with his elbow wrapped up. It was the entire season, so there was right. clearly 
something that was bothering him. Um, there were also, you know, times where there were days when it looked uncomfortable when you watched him throw. Totally. He would, he would get really short arm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there and there were several times when he had to let it go from certain angles when he was like in a shift or something. And you could see it was almost like he was like, all right, let's see how this goes. And, you know, the way he was letting it go. And the so, accuracy was was not there on those throws. Right. Right. So I do wonder about, you know, the shortstop part of it. And yeah. then now with the shift, <laughs> you know, the shift rules and everything, you know, the shortstops are going to be back to where the shortstops are supposed to play. They're not going to right. be close to the second base anymore because the second baseman is going to be where he's supposed to be. So that's going to change some of the throwing too. I mean, Kike can play short, but he's, he's played, he started 64 games in his career at short. He's not an everyday shortstop. I so, think he, I think he has the ability to be, but then you need to go get like a Brandon Nimmo or somebody to play oh, center field. I just wonder if health wise, he could stick at shortstop the, the whole year. You right. know, I think that would be hard on his body to do that. Yeah, and shortstop's not a place you want to have question marks of, can this guy be there? Xander yeah. Bogarts is going to play 150 games every right. year. He always did. So, and I, you know, I mean, they didn't sign Xander. It, do it doesn't seem very realistic to think they're going to go out and get Carlos Correa. No. Uh, as much as Alex loves him and as much as he loves Alex. Um, and then Dansby Swanson, I mean, I would think. Well, his market's up now, too, because of this. Yeah. So. And I would think the Braves are going to do what they have to do to keep him. But, yeah, I, I don't know. It's the whole, you know, it's a, a lot of it. You know, you, you try to look on paper and things fit when Xander was there. And now without Xander, think there's things just don't fit. Right. And I think the lack of sorry, Danny, I know I'm I'm blabbering. I'm I'm locked in with, with Pete right now. Yeah, but, I refer to my uh, Red Sox experts here. Yes. Yeah, just sit back and relax. Uh yeah. I think I'm trying to think the best way to say this. Um, uh, I think something where a lot of people aren't talking about right now is is the lack of starting pitching and that that kind of compounds this problem of losing Xander. Like now I feel like Okay, kind of you were you made me think of it when you're like people don't you know it fits when Xander's there like okay our offense is good our infield's good well now that he's gone now I'm like oh man there's other major problems too like is Chris Sale healthy is Paxton healthy can we like, Chris Sale's their ace like he's their number one and he's thrown two innings for in the last couple of years so it's like what what's going on our pets heads are falling off Pete I don't know what, what's going on right now. You know, so they, they've, they've gone out and signed two relievers so far, right? And they're, they're I like those moves. Right, three right. relievers. Three relievers. Oh, three, right. And they're going to need – they're going to have to build a good bullpen because if everything is perfectly fine with Chris Sale and James Paxton, it's going to be about 150 innings. It's not going to be 175 or 180. No. Uh, Garrett Whitlock, who they're putting in the rotation, is coming off a hip surgery. If everything is perfectly awesome with Garrett Whitlock, 150. 145, 150. You're going to have to find innings somewhere. Um and whether, you know, I think they need to sign two starters. They need to put Nick Pavetta in like a swingman role where he yes. gets occasional starts, occasionally goes three innings. Um, and they're going to need probably somebody else who can give them, you know, a, a reliever who's more than three outs. I'm, I am excited to see Brian Bayo. Like, you yeah. know, he, he looked so good at his last five starts of the year, you know. But, but is he going to give you 175 innings at his age? And, and what, you know, it would be hard to say that he could do that. So, right. And you're not gonna you're not gonna push a guy at that age and you know a young guy and you know overload him. There's legit question marks with every starting pitcher yeah. on that staff. Yeah, absolutely. even if they if they bring back Michael Walker, which that's gonna cost them twelve this year, probably thirteen, uh, maybe. I know they're talking to Nate because Nate's market has been depressed by having the qualifying offer attached to him. Right. Um. You know, and I mean, I love Nate, but Nate's had injury issues over the years too. So we uh, saw when his velocity's not there, he's not the same guy. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the rotation has a lot of question marks. Um, you know, there's only how many times can you keep running, you know, you know, Josh Winkowski and all of those kind of, you know, those triple A fringy guys. Cutter. You know, yeah. It, it's hard to get. You know, they got way too many innings out of those guys last year. They need to be fewer, but they, you know, they had no choice. Yeah. It's, it's, um, or if, I mean, right now, if you looked at it, right, they're, you know, they're battling Baltimore for fourth place. I mean, that's, that's, that's what they have right now. Jeez. It, we look at who's left. Right now, the, the two biggest ones are Dansby Swanson and Carlos Correa in the shortstop department. You mentioned that Carlos Correa, probably not an option. Indications are that Dansby's going to be a little bit more economical compared to those top three guys that uh, at the shortstop position. Are the Red Sox in on Dansby? And if not, are they looking elsewhere or are they looking internal? I haven't heard that they are with, with Swanson. Um, I mean, everything was so focused on Xander that, you know, we don't really know what they were thinking about shortstop. Bloom has talked a lot about that no matter what they do, they're going to have to make some trades. 
Um, you know, maybe they have a shortstop in mind in terms of that. I mean, I, I just think they're going to try to get away with story. And yeah, I think that. so too. That's, that's what I think is what I, what's going to happen because they have so many other things they need to do. I don't know that they could go out and get a shortstop and do all of those other things. So, I, you know, the only thing I, I would wonder would be if the backlash from the Xander thing is so bad that ownership says with Alex Cora prodding them, all right, go out and get Carlos Correa. He's two years younger. You know, he's a great player. Um, you know, yeah, he's got that kind of damage from, you know, the Astros thing and everything. But I mean, he is, he is, I think a great, you know, he's not a product of sign stealing. He's a really good player. Right. I mean, I just wonder if they might pan, not panic, but you know, ownership will say, well, we got to fix this. We got to get people back on our side, go get Carlos Correa. But that would be, I think panic's a word. I think panic's a perfect word for this. Uh, they are, they, they should panic a little bit. Part, part of my naivety here. This is why I defer to my Red Sox guys here. Is it possible you bring on Hein Bloom, a guy that was originally from Tampa Bay, more economical than obviously than Dave Dombrowski goes without saying. <laughs> Is it possible that John Henry could be looking into potentially selling the team in the near future? A lot of people have asked me that, and I, I don't buy that. I mean, they're they're a money making machine no matter what they do. I mean, they signed a ten year deal with Mass Mutual the other day to to put like a patch this big on the sleeve of the uniform. I mean. They, you know, they they just you know Fenway Park is a tourist attraction at this point. I mean, they you know they money comes in no matter what they do, and FSG. I mean that you know the FSG is an enormous multinational company right now, and the Red Sox are at the center of that. So I'd be very surprised if they were loading up for sale. I mean, they they certainly the Red Sox would get a huge number, but there's no way that I mean they're they're strengthening their other properties. So I, I don't know that they would do that, but um, I don't know. It's it's. I don't know. A lot of people say like, well, they're more concerned about their other teams, but I mean, they had Liverpool when they won in 18, they had Liverpool when they won in 13. I mean, I don't think it's that. I just think they, he's the, John Henry's decided Tampa Bay was right on our tail spending a third of the money. Like why can't, why can't we do things that way? And, and combine that with a higher payroll that we, that should be a great success. And so far it hasn't been. Do you think ownership of teams has a, choice to make to either be profitable or chase winning like do you yeah, think well, that's a... i don't think they're ever not profitable i, I don't think you could spend well, more profitable i guess yeah um i mean you, you look at john middleton with the phillies you know and, and he's he's basically decided i want to win no matter what and i don't care if i have four dhs in the lineup and you hope to hell nobody hits the ball in the outfield like but i don't care we're just going to try to win yeah I and mean, they, they they go to the world series they lose the six games and he's like, screw it, get Trey Turner. Like, you know, <laughs> and there's guys who think that way. They're they, they, you know, this guy wants his legacy to be, I want a World Series in Philadelphia. And that's what the guy in San Diego wants. That's what the guy in Texas wants. The guy in Texas is, is insane. I mean, that money for Jacob DeGrom and gets Bruce Bochy out of the time. I mean, he's doing whatever he's gonna do. And, you know, I don't know, maybe you know, the, the Red Sox have had that that time. Maybe, you know, maybe they're they've they've decided. You know, we have to try to go about it a different way. I think having an owner that is a fan is not that John Henry isn't a fan. I know he watches the game like a fan. Um, but I think having a guy like Stevie Cohen and, and, and Preller, like these guys, well, Preller's a GM, not an owner, but owners he's that are fans guy, of the team. It's like, I just feel like they go after it more. Well, I was laughing. I saw a story about Steve Cohen that said in his in his brokerage office, he has this um, a shark, like a great white shark that's supposed to be like an R object. And it's in like a giant container and it's like in three pieces. And it's supposed to represent, you know, the fierce, you know, he's like a, a shark in the, in the world of economics. It cost him like $20 million. Like it was some insane price. And then he had to get it fixed because like the tank was leaking or something, like whatever. He spent like 10 million bucks on that. So I said to somebody, this guy dropped $30 million for something in the lobby of his office. You think he gives a crap about the the CBT rules or whatever? It's you know he, doesn't, no. he wants to be the guy who wins the World Series for the Mets. They made they made a threshold yeah. that's named after him. Right, he wants to walk around New York and everybody go, "Hey, Steve, you know you're the man, buddy." Like you know he doesn't care about you know oh, he wants to be the man. That's who he that. is. Yeah, twenty yeah. percent pocket change to that guy or whatever you know. So and you know John Henry's not that guy. I mean I don't think Hal Steinbrenner is that guy. He's trying to be pretty careful too. I mean right. You know, oh, but, we, saw, we saw that the last couple of years. He's not that yeah. guy. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's different guys now who own these teams. And then, you know, they all used to work with Bud Selig to keep the prices down. 
and now a lot of them are like, well, we don't care. We're just going to, you know, I want to win. Um, I, sorry, I have one more Red Sox question, then we can float, but uh, and we can let you get out of here. Uh, Masataka Yoshida, like, what do you got on this guy? I, I've been looking at the, the scouting reports, it looks like high contact, good bats of ball skills, just okay in the outfield, which you can hide an okay outfielder in left at, at Fenway. You know, th- there's a security there as a bad outfielder with the wall behind you. So, um, is he a leadoff guy for the Boston Red Sox? Well, I think he's, yeah, I think he is a leadoff hitter. He's got a high, huge OBP in, in Japan. Here's the funny thing about him. So Boris represents him too. So yesterday, Perfect. so yesterday he, he was posted by the Japanese team, which means he's not a free agent. There's a 45 day window and you can sign him. You basically pay a fee to the, you team. pay the team like $15 million. right? Yeah. But you know, theoretically, you know, he goes back to Japan, you know, you know, the, the team doesn't have to accept the fee. There's all sorts of rules about it. So yeah. what agents normally do is they use the whole 45 days to try to jack up the price of their guy and get the most money that they can get out of him. Like when the Red Sox got Daisuke Matsuzaka, remember there was a deadline and that was because he was posted. So he gets posted yesterday at nine o'clock in the morning. By nine o'clock at night, he signed with the Red Sox. So I was asking the Bournemouth people, like, what happened? The Red Sox offer was so much higher than all of the other teams. They were like, well, we're not going to waste any time because these other teams are never coming to 190 million. We you know, just do it now. The Japanese reporters at the winter meetings were like shocked because they, they expected this would take like a month and a half. And, you know, this this dude's on his way to Boston and whatever. I mean, so, my God, make sure to pay the guy from Japan that's never been to Boston in his life. But yeah. the guy who can is the face of the team in Boston, beat it, kid. So what I'm writing about for tomorrow is like how, you know, the Red Sox decided Xander is not worth this. When, you know, we're never going there. But the Japanese guy who there's some questions about, you know, well, yeah, 90 million is where we see it. Now, they could have taken that 90 million and signed Bogarts. Um, they chose not to. I mean, maybe they maybe the Japanese guy is Japanese Dustin Pedroia and he's going to spray the ball all over the field. And he's five eight. I think he's five eight, one seventy eight or something like that. You know, maybe he's going to be like a super exciting player. I don't know. I've never seen him. But if he's not, <laughs> I mean, man, it's going to be a, it's going to be a hard couple of years at Fenway if he's not, because they're putting a lot of faith in that dude. Yeah. Yeah, I guess only time will tell. Check Wait, out- hold on, Danny. Hold your horses. I had something tied on to that and I forgot. Is Alex Verdugo like tradable? Well, you know, For- I mean, they they publicly uh, challenged him at the end of last season. They said right. he's he's going to get in better shape. He's going to get more devoted to baseball. You know, all kinds of different stuff. That's wouldn't seem to help his trade value very much. That you're questioning his commitment, right? Um, so I don't know I, if you're trading him now. You're trading him, you know, at a low point in his value. The guy can hit. But yeah. I'm just thinking about like a Pablo Lopez or somebody like that. I don't know. I mean, I think he's going to go to right field. The Japanese guy will be in left. left. Yeah. You know, Kike will be in center, um, assuming he's not somewhere else. So and- let's say they sign Brand Nimmo, which I I don't think it's going to happen. But let's say they do. Then you have three left-handed hitting outfielders, and well, that's, a, yeah, into that. that's a problem too. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. Like we, I think this is like going to be the third or fourth time we've said this. There's none of it seems to fit. Nothing. It's very strange. Nothing. And- it's um. And I'm just throwing like random Red Sox thoughts at you, so I apologize. No, no, dude, this is like uh, it's what we do. It's like our text chain. Talk about baseball. (laughs) Anytime I have a question, I'm like, Pete. I know it's three in the morning, but um, (laughs) what do you got on this? Yeah, I just always answers. There's a long time before the season starts. You know, like it's you know you can't say what is it December eighth. You know, all right, well that's it. They're screwed. You know, right? Let's see. Oh, my Twitter mentions are on fire. Oh no, everybody's everybody's giving up, but. You know, I guess we got to wait and see what they look like when they get to spring training. But, um, yeah, it's I don't know, man. It's, uh, you know, I make my money when this team is good. It's it's good for it's good for business for the Boston Globe when this team is good. And yeah. I really wonder what what things are going to be like, you know. BostonGlobe.com, Pete Abe. Thanks for stopping by. Do not forget your boxes of Kleenex tomorrow at Xander Bogarts' uh, press oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna have like a black kerchief over my head and like sunglasses. I and, like, I texted you know, with him today and already told him, but please give him a hug and tell him I love him. I'm gonna be it's gonna be like the Chris Farley show. I'm gonna be like Xander. Remember the time you guys won that World Series? That was awesome. Twice. <laughs> and now we don't. And now we just forgot about you. Pete, thanks for coming and hanging out, man. You're you're the best. Anytime, boys. Whatever you want.